My husband Tony and I recently visited Israel. This is a dream come true for me, and let me tell you why. About 18 years ago, I had a dream, or perhaps it was a vision, because it was so vivid, and I still remember it as if it had happened last night. In my dream, I visited Israel with a Christian group. At the time of my dream, I didn't know much about Israel, and for me, it was a distant country mentioned in the Bible. I didn't know how it looked like. However, in my dream, I saw the mountains near the Dead Sea, and someone spoke to me about how to get in the Dead Sea. When we visited Israel this year, 2023, it was just like I saw it in my dream 18 years ago. At that time, I didn't know what or where a Dead Sea was, but God, in His wonderful mercy, showed it to me. The dream prompted me to learn about Israel and study the Bible in detail. I also discovered that my maiden last name, Perez, had Sephardic Jewish origins in Spain. I think God was calling me home. Perez in the Bible was the son of Judah and Tamar, Genesis 38:29. Perez became the leader of the Perezite clan. Genesis 46, 12. The family was well known and respected, as evidenced by the blessing at the wedding of Boaz and Ruth. Ruth 4, 11, 12. Hello, this is Tony and Maria Majabani. We are on our way from Albany, Georgia, driving to Atlanta, and there we're going to take a flight to Boston. See you soon. Shalom. to Boston, had a four hours layover, and at 4 p.m. departed to Tel Aviv in a 10 and a half hours flight. They gave us comfortable slippers, blankets, socks, toiletry, a sleep mask, and good food. I slept about six hours, and Tony watched movies most of the time. At the Tel Aviv airport, we went through customs, then we waited for the rest of the group to arrive. The tour was with the Elijah streams. From Tel Aviv, we traveled one and a half hours to Tiberias, to our hotel at the Sea of Galilee. I prayed, please Lord, can we have a room with a view to the sea? And he granted it. I love God so much. This is the view from the balcony in our room. I was amazed by the beauty of the sea, it is really a lake called Sea, and also by the mountains. I tried to play a movie in my mind of Jesus walking around the Sea of Galilee and the mountains. Our next adventure was going to the Sea of Galilee. We were about 300 people in three boats. The boats were tied together in the middle of the lake, and we had a worship service with Robin Bullock and Steve Swanson. When we got in the boat, it started raining. I learned it only rains in Israel about 32 to 33 days a year, so we brought blessing in the form of rain to Israel. We drove north to the Golan Heights and visited Caesarea Philippi, situated 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee, at the base of Mount Hermon. Caesarea Philippi is the location of one of the largest water springs in Israel, and it fits into the Jordan River. It was here that Jesus identified himself as the Messiah. In Matthew 16, Jesus asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The cave in Caesarea Philippi is called the Gate to Hell because there was a pagan worshipping 
going on at the time of Jesus. We saw the place where the statue of the pagan god Pan once was and now is empty. Jesus made a strong point by going to Pan's temple, the gate to hell. And that's why he said in Matthew 16, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In the Bible, Jesus is the rock. The church had to be built of Jesus, the rock, not on a man. He was saying, hey Peter, like that is your name for sure. So for sure, I will build my church on my rock, meaning on Jesus himself. We ascended to Mount Bento for a view into Syria. We saw farms of apples and cherries. It is a beautiful view. Let all the nations of the world hear me. And all languages understand that God is God over everything and not just this land. But from here is His place that all the nations revere Israel. Come on and lift your hands. In Mount Carmel, we prayed over Israel and the United States, two nations created in the love of God. After the prayers, I heard a shofar blown in the mountain. It was a sound in the spirit, letting me know the victory is God's. We went to Nazareth. It was an amazing feeling when I started to see the mountains where it is located 1,200 feet above sea level. As we were driving, we were also um, saw a tomb that was found when they were constructing the new road. And there were more tombs along the road that they found also that was very interesting. Nazareth is beautiful. Pictures do not do justice to the beauty of Nazareth. We visited Mount Precipice, where angry Jewish worshipers tried to throw Jesus over the cliff. We saw the Valley of Armageddon and also the mountain of Jesus' transfiguration. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We were baptized in the Jordan River. It was an amazing experience. 
to go to the river where Jesus was baptized before he started his ministry. We saw the remains of the town and the house of Peter. Capernaum is beautiful. It is situated at the Sea of Galilee. I could have stayed there all day. As we were approaching Jerusalem, I was amazed with the beauty of the mountains and the houses. Everything is built in Jerusalem stone, limestone, and it's got to be similar colors, the same light colors, and it looks so beautiful. We stopped across the Hebrew University and had a wonderful view of the city. We walked to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed. There are trees that are old enough to have seen Jesus praying. There is a beautiful garden.
visit to the garden tomb was the most emotional one for me. We entered the empty tomb. The Lord lives. We had worship there and it was amazing. Some people saw the two angels still guarding the tomb and others saw them in the pictures they took. Pretty amazing. While walking in the garden, I smelled a sweet aroma similar to gardenias, but couldn't find the source of it. It was a gift from God. In the city of David, we visited the archaeological excavations and the Hezekiah's tunnel used to bring water. I'm sorry. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> the upper room is a beautiful and peaceful place. Here, Jesus had the last supper with his disciples.
At the Western Wall, we brought our prayers. I prayed in this place and had a beautiful experience. While driving to Masada, we had the first views of the Dead Sea. I was amazed. It was so impressive. In Masada, we visited the ruins of Herod's Palace. We had to take a cable car to transport, transport us high on the mountain. From the mountain, we were able to see the Dead Sea and also the monument to the Israelite soldiers who died during the Roman invasion. This is the Ahava Cosmetic Product Factory, very famous. Qumran is the place where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. We saw the caves and the town where the Essenes lived. They were a pious Jewish group that struggled to live pure biblical lives in a world fast becoming unstable and disheartening. Thousands of copies of the books of the Bible, Old Testament, were found here. There is a store and a place to eat. You can shop for Dead Sea Cosmetics. Very nice. The Dead Sea Scrolls were found by a Muslim shepherd boy. He had thrown a stone inside a cave and heard a strange sound. And it was a clay vessel used to store the scrolls. He took the scrolls to his father and his father almost made shoes out of the leather scrolls, but the shoemaker took them to his rabbi and sold three of them for a hundred dollars. 
Years later, the rabbi's son bought the other four for $250,000. Today, the scrolls are in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. We enjoyed some time at Kalaya Beach with the natural healing mud and the opportunity to float on the Dead Sea waters where you can literally sit and float. Drink it now, yeah. in the land of Israel whilst the temple was standing here at Shiloh. That and more at our next session. I like it. <laughs> There's Tony, say hello to the camera. We are in Shiloh with the the temple was for 400 years, the tabernacle. Let's grab a seat, then rest first. Verse. And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite sojourning in the remote mountains of Ephraim. These are the remote mountains of Ephraim. He took for himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. Okay, so we won't read the whole chapter. But to cut a long story short, this concubine ran away back to her father and he went to fetch her. And on the way back, um, no one would take them in. Night fell, no one would take them in. 
And they arrived at the, at the place called Yiva'a, or Yiba'a, in English. us in our wanderings through the desert, taken apart and reassembled again and again. After entering the Holy Land, Joshua established the tabernacle in Shiloh. The Shiloh tabernacle is built of a stone foundation and wooden beams and covered by layers of fabric, a combination symbolizing the transition from a temporary tabernacle to a more permanent one. Shiloh is to be the dwelling place of the Shekhinah, the divine presence, the holiest site for the Jewish people for 369 years. The tabernacle was comprised of two main parts, the courtyard and the tabernacle tent. The tabernacle courtyard was rectangular, 100 cubits in length by 50 cubits in width, about 50 meters by 25 meters. In the heart of the courtyard stood the altar, made of wood overlaid with copper. On it burned the eternal fire, on which sacrifices, meal offerings, and wine offerings were made every single day. Since it is forbidden to ascend the altar by stairs, the Kohanim, the priests, ascended by a ramp. Before the Kohanim begin the tabernacle service, they would purify their hands and feet in the copper laving basin which stood between the altar and the tabernacle tent. It is said that when the contributions for the tabernacle were collected in the desert, all the women donated their copper mirrors from which the laving basin was made. First thing in the morning, the Kohanim entered the tabernacle tent, the sanctuary, for the day's service. Twice a day, they burned incense on the gold-plated incense altar a blend of 11 special spices, which were placed on the coals, and whose wonderful perfume wafted far into the distance. Once a week, 12 special loaves of bread were placed on the golden table, which stood at the north end of the sanctuary. The secret method of preparing the showbread was passed down from father to son. Every evening, the candles of the seven-branched menorah, which stood in the south, across from the table, were kindled. The menorah was made of a single piece of solid gold and ornamented with flower-like cups, buds, and blossoms. At the tip of every branch was a receptacle into which pure olive oil was poured. Ever since, the menorah has been one of the symbols of the Jewish nation. entered the Holy of Holies. In the Holy of Holies stood the Ark of the Covenant, on top of which were the curtain and the two cherubs. The cherubs were in the form of two angels facing each other with wings outstretched over the Ark. Inside the Ark were the tablets of the Covenant, the first tablets which were broken by Moses and the second unbroken tablets. The tablets and the broken tablets lie inside the Ark. This is the place from which God's voice is heard. And I will speak to you from above the Ark cover, between the two cherubs, which are above the Ark of the Covenant. The tabernacle is a place of meeting. 
where man meets himself, where man meets his brothers and his people, where man meets his creator. There is much more to it than meets the eye. The clues and secrets hidden in every part of the tabernacle and its vessels are many and lofty. For 369 years, the tabernacle dwelt in Shiloh until the city was destroyed by the Philistines. It then wandered until Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem. But to this very day it is said, if you stand where the tabernacle stood and take a deep, deep breath, you can smell, if only for a moment, the scent of the incense which still suffuses the walls. Benjamin refused to hold, to hand over the perpetrators of the murderer and the rape, not because they condoned it, because, but because they wanted to judge them by themselves. But the tribe said, no, 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 this is, this is a national thing. You're going to hold them over. And they refused. So there was a large battle and the, and the Benjaminites lost. Um, and in the end, um, people said, okay, well, we don't want to annihilate Benjamin, but taken a vow not to enable intermarriage with the Benjaminites. We were not allowed to give our daughters, so there, there, were, there were progeny from uh, from the 400 refugees from Benjamin who actually survived the war. So what are we going to do? So uh, it was a two-tiered solution. First, the, the first part was bringing uh, uh, wives from the eastern side of the Jordan River, from the two and a half tribes which hadn't participated in the war and therefore had not taken the vow of prevention of intermarriage. And another solution is as follows. Then they said, in fact, <coughs> Judges 21 verse 19, there is a yearly feast of the Lord in Shiloh, which is north of Bethel, on the east side of the highway that goes up from Bethel to Shechem and south of Levona. Therefore they instructed the children of Benjamin saying, Go lie and in wait in the vineyards and watch. And just when the daughters of Shiloh come out to perform their dances, then come out of the vineyards and every man catch a wife for himself from the daughters of Shiloh, then go to the land of Benjamin. Now, I'm not going to discuss the morality or the immorality of the solution. Okay? But what interests us are the biblical directions to Shiloh. Listen again. In fact, then they said, in fact, there's a yearly feast of the Lord in Shiloh, which is north of Bethel. Where is Bethel? Bethel has been identified by archaeologists at a village called Bitin. Bitin's nine miles that way, south of us. So we are north of Bitin, on the east side of the highway. The highway which runs north to south, which you probably came on, came from Jerusalem this morning. Yes. You drove on it, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> is, in fact, the ancient highway which enabled people to travel from Beersheba to Nazareth in the Galilee, today known by the Israel Roads Authorities at route number 60. That's the road. So we are east of the road. That's west. And that's east, so we are east of the road. On the east side of the highway, it goes from Bet El to Shechem and south of Levona. Shechem is eight miles to the north of us, and Levona is just over that ridge. So we are indeed in the vicinity of what looks like to be Shiloh. Biblical directions. I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to come back to it <clears throat> later on. Why did the men of Benjamin have to be given directions to Shiloh? Where is Benjamin's tribal area? Nine miles that way. I didn't know. <laughs> no one came shopping here? <laughs> Does someone know how to have to be told where London is, where New York is, where Sydney, where Berlin? Everyone knows. They had to be given directions. Why? Think about it. Okay, archaeology. So that's the first reason, that's the first criteria. Biblical directions. Second criteria, archaeology. 
<coughs> so ex excavations have been have been carried out here since the 1920s, 20th century. A Danish expedition came here during the British mandate and carried out excavations. And in fact, in a couple of weeks, the season starts again and they're going to uh, continue. A long story short, the uh, strata which have been unearthed here at Shiloh date from Middle Bronze to Early Muslim. In English, it means Middle Bronze is 3,000 years ago. Early Muslim is Muhammad 627 AD. Okay, now, if children of Israel, if Solomon built, built his temple around 1000 BCE, so backtrack, so we're talking about 1400, 1300 before Christ. And if strata which has been, have been unearthed here for the Middle Bronze 3000 years ago, we're in the range. So people indeed lived here during the time whilst the tabernacle actually <coughs> stood. So the archaeology fits. Preservation of a name. Edward Robinson, who was uh, a priest and also uh, uh, some sort of adventurer, arrived here uh, at the end of the 19th century and asked the local Bedouin, Shuhada, what is this place called? And they said, Hada Sailun. Sailun and the British, being very efficient as usual, <laughs> very colonialist as usual, made a map. And on the map, indeed, they wrote Sailun. This is a map of the PEF from 1880, okay? And it says Sailun, okay? Just in the middle, okay? So we have the archaeology. Here is Shiloh. Welcome to Shiloh. This is Shiloh. And so on. And, you are here. and in fact, you are here. Yeah. Uh, well, you don't usually get that. It's very rare. But here, in the Byzantine, ruins of the Byzantine church, not the square uh, building, that's a mosque, but on the mosaic of the Byzantine church, there has been unearthed an ancient Greek inscription. Can I read ancient Greek? No. Neither do I. <laughs> but it says, Jesus Christ bless the people. So you don't get any better than that, ladies and gentlemen. It doesn't get any better than that. It so it's here. Of any questions? Right. I've been asked two questions. The first one is about um, the scroll which is affixed to your doorposts in the hotel and which some of you very kind, most kindly pointed out here in the hologram. Well, the reason for that is, is in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 6, um, it goes like this. Um, Hear, O Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one. It's called the Shema. Shema, right? Mm -hmm. the, uh, central uh, paragraph for us uh, in Judaism, right? And at the end it says, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So this is the commandment the Jewish people are commanded to affix the word of God mm -hmm. on the doorpost. Now what exactly is inside that sort of thing which is stuck on the doorpost? Two paragraphs, this paragraph, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one, so on and so forth. And another paragraph which appears in Deuteronomy uh, 11. Okay? So, when Jews go and visit other places, they go to Prague, they go to Warsaw, you know, you go, you go to Holocaust tours and so on and so forth. <clears throat> one, of the, one of the signs which you can identify a Jewish house by is... The Mezuzah is not there, the scrolls are not there, because the Nazis and the Romans and the Byzantines and the Muslims all, all burnt it. Sometimes there is, there is a sort of niche, a sort of etching, when in the past the Jews used, the Jews used to uh, affix a scroll on the doorpost of the house. Okay, answer the question? Yes. Right, so we are pressed for time. Okay, so we've got to go to the, um, uh, the audiovisual experience. Um, just look at the ruins on both sides of the iron... Uh, steps and we'll talk about them
later on. We drove north from Jerusalem into Samaria and arrived at ancient Shiloh. This is the place where the tabernacle of God stood for almost 400 years. It is the place where Hannah prayed her famous prayer. Samuel was born here. go by. Rumors about corruption in Shiloh spread everywhere. The people avoid going to the tabernacle and desert it. But one man continues to come despite everything. Elkanah of Har Ephraim. He takes his two wives and his children and comes to the tabernacle.
Canaan, in Canaan, ancient Celtic places, were usually situated on tops of mountains. Mm. Mountains. Now, at the tabernacle, and the queuing, and the livestock, and the families, and the mother in law, and the everyone, there's, there's no room but here at this a location in Geelong. Up there, so this is the only place, as far as the topography is concerned, where the tabernacle could have stood. Thirdly, um, archaeologists have found uh, numerous caches of potsherds on all the hills overlooking this site. So what? This is Israel. Without a potsherd. 4,000 years of history. And the patriarch. The rich mandate you found some potsherds. So what's the big deal? <laughs> Whilst the temple stood in Jerusalem, there was stipulation that one had to consume the sacrificial meat within the walls. Okay? Not the walls of today, those are Turkish. So when Solomon's temple stood, stood and Herod's temple stood, there were walls and sacrificial meat being brought to the temple three times a year, tabernacles, Pen uh, Pentecost, and, um, and Passover. Thank you. Had to be consumed within the walls. <coughs> in Shiloh, there were no walls. This is before Jerusalem. This is before David. This is before King David. There was no Jerusalem. So the stipulation was that from when, wherever you could see the tabernacle, you could consume the meat. So the assumption is that people arrived here with baggage train, the land cruiser, and everything, <laughs> out on the hillside, sent a representative with the lamb or the goat or whatever, made the sacrifice, chewing, made the sacrifice, and then, after have, uh, dividing, it, dividing it up, would return to uh, the family who would have camped out on one of the hillsides overlooking the tabernacle. If you wanted to eat sacrificial meat, you had to look, you had to see the tabernacle. <coughs> okay, so what do you do with a, with a utensil after you have consumed sacrificial meat? You can't take it home for Cheerios, it's no good. It's sanctified, it's holy. So what do you do? You break it. Potchers. Potchers. Okay, so there's the three reasons why people assume that the tabernacle. This is Isaiah on the eve of invasion by Sennacherib, the Assyrians, 8th century BC. Did anyone listen? No. No one ever listened. Prophet. We're thinking about being a prophet, that line of uh, patient, forget it, no one listens. But that's the first lesson here in Shiloh, it's not about six and stone, it's about what you do, about your heart. Now, second lesson is that when Hannah arrived here and prayed for her son, who was she praying for? She wasn't praying for herself, she didn't want him on a tricycle in her backyard and to grow up, be a lawyer, doctor, or any something nice Jewish boy would have had to be then, 3,000 years ago. Who did she want a son for? The Lord. For God, absolutely, for the Lord. And it says so in the Bible. Hannah said, And she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. I don't want a child for myself. I want a child to give to the Lord. And that's why the Jewish sages, well, when they teach us in Jewry and Judaism the concept of the purest prayer that could be, they go back. Hannah was selfless, and that's why the Jewish sages taught us how to pray. Who started it? Hannah. Hannah started it. Here. One last, one last uh, sentence, if I may. Why do we need directions to Shiloh? Remember the question? No one knew where it was. God's presence stuck up. God's presence. No one knew. No one cared. No one arrived. No one was interested. Everyone sat under his feet, under his or her vine. Who 
came, Elkanah. Elkanah was Samuel's father. How do we know he came? Because the first verse in the book of Samuel says, now there was a certain man of Ramadan, Tzofim, and his name was Elkanah, and so on and so forth. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and so on and so forth. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Uh, dear Mr. Samuel the prophet, have you nothing better to start off your book with, apart from saying how your mother and father got up? And the tent flaps they heard the breathing it's because the scripture is a revelation of one man from beginning to end Jesus the Christ and if you looked out what you were seeing was this if Jesus had had have laid down in the tabernacle this way his feet would have rested on the brazen altar. And the book of Revelation says that his feet are burned like fine brass. And the laver would have landed about where his belly is. And he said, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. In his right hand laying down would have been the, the menorah. Aminoah, would have been the seven branched candlestick and the book of Revelation declares that he holds the seven stars in his right hand and his left hand would have been the table of showbread and he said healing is the children's bread where his heart would be would be the golden altar of incense the heart of God if he were to lay down and his head would rest on the mercy seat of the ark, the mind of Christ. And what, what they were seeing when they looked out toward the tabernacle was a prophecy. Every piece of it was a prophecy. Every part of it was a prophecy. A prophecy of the Messiah, the Mashiach that would come, the Christ. It's a prophecy and what they were seeing <sighs> was his laboring on the cross one day he was he was prophesying that he was the, because the temple was laid out in a cross and he was laying out there in the spirit you could hear him laboring laboring because it was pointing to one day he would come and die for all mankind and for those that would receive him this he would be they would become the sons of god hallelujah this is the revelation of shiloh said so a scepter will not depart from judah until shiloh comes Shiloh. It tells the address. It's another name for Yeshua in the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant is the New Covenant concealed. And the New Covenant is the Old Covenant revealed. And they cross in Him. I wear the Star of David all the time. The Megan David. I wear it because, of course, 
I love Israel, and all those that know me know that. And I'm a prophet to Jerusalem, to the United States, and to tribal nations in America. But the Star of David is a unique thing. And the, though this, the whole Hebrew alphabet can be found in it, his name can be found in it, and David's name, so forth. But there is a revelation of it bigger than I think most people have ever gotten before. And I want you to hear it. In the days of the exodus from Egypt, the Lord told the children of Israel, said, put, put the blood of the lamb on the top post, on the, on the side post and on the top. And it made a triangle. But when Yeshua hung on the cross, they drove nails in this hand, this hand and in his feet. And it made a triangle this way. You had one this way in the Exodus and one this way in his death. And if you push the two together, it becomes this. And you and I live in the middle of it. So today at Shiloh, I keep wanting to sing that. Uh, I keep wanting to change the words to that. I don't know who sang that. <laughs> Eric Clapton, maybe. But I keep wanting to change those words and say, Shiloh. And Neil Diamond saying about Shiloh. That's who he's talking about. So today we're very honored to get to stand here and play, worship and prophetic music, declaration, proclamation. You know, in the book of Ezekiel, when the dry bones are there, and he took Ezekiel and set him in the middle of it, and he said, prophesy, prophesy, prophesy to the four winds. I believe the breath of that prophetic utterance is coming from the church. You need to prophesy that a mighty army be raised here in this land. Yes. Yes that they stand before God like never before. This is a special place. It's the apple of his eye. There's only so long a time you can put your finger in someone's eye. And so whether many know it here or many don't, it makes no difference. You know. And so what you know you're responsible for. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for it. Pray for it, that there be peace within its walls. It is the land that is the tithe of the whole earth. However a nation treats this nation is the what they will reap just like a tithe. So God has given everyone a tithe to give, a tenth of everything you prosper with, yes. But also nations treat Israel right. So shall your nation prosper. The day will come in the ten of booths, in those gatherings when the nations who refuse to come, there'll be no rain millennial reign. Israel is a tithe to the world. You watch how you handle that. It's a holy thing. Amen. Amen. I'll give you a prophetic mystery and hand the mic to somebody who needs it. <clears throat> when Adam sinned and he fell, was in this land. He sinned and he fell. Notice the first thing he did was he made him, sewed him, him and his wife sewed together fig leaves to make a covering for themselves. The 
fig tree symbolizes this nation in the scripture. And it was a prophecy going forth. Later, it said the fig leaves didn't cover him. The bloody robes of a ram covered him or of an animal. And it was a prophecy that you will stay in the covering of this nation until the lamb comes and sheds his blood for you. <coughs> Some of you didn't even hear that, I think. That was a prophecy beginning from the start. And it told not only that the first covenant would be here, but also it told from where the Messiah would come. Hallelujah. This is a holy land. That's why we call it the holy land. God in flesh put his foot here. Amen. Before that, God watered the whole face of the ground. And I will tell you this, and then I will stop, I think. No. Have you enjoyed coming today to Shiloh? Yes. How many of you sense the prophetic atmosphere today? Did you sense it when it changed? We were just worshiping and then suddenly it changed. As Krista tells me all the time, we were driving along and then suddenly <laughs> it did like that. <clears throat> when God created Adam, and I must tell this, I cannot, this is, is this the last time I speak on this? Somebody nod, yes, no, yes, yes. Somebody said, thank God. No, no. Didn't. and no, we don't. I'm just picking at you. Uh, it was a little humor, very little. <laughs> now, when when God, the Scripture said He watered the whole face of the ground, not just the place where Adam was, the whole face of the earth was watered, because He was about to send a message to the to the earth, the whole earth that the man was, was here. And God lay down in that wet earth and made a cast of his own image. And it lay there under the ground for three days and three nights. And on day three is when it was planted. On day six, he uncovered the ground. And he laid down on top of the man, Adam. Adam, red and rosy, blood in your face. And he laid down on him. Now you know where Elijah got that from, stretching himself on the dead boy. You know where Elisha got that from, stretching himself on the dead boy. And God laid down, the Hebrew says he shadowed the man. It means he laid down on him, on his image and likeness. Put his eyes on his eyes so that man could see what he could see. His mouth on his mouth so that the man could speak what he could speak. And his fingertips to his fingertips so he could reach what he reaches. And above him to show the only thing above him is God himself. And that he would meet every need. And so he uncovered the ground after three days and nights. And he raised that cast up out of the dust. And it looked like an open grave and a resurrection took place on day six, three days and nights later. And the man stood there blinking. Couldn't you see him? He didn't draw back in fear. Because God, listen, God wasn't just manufacturing a man. He was reproducing himself in the earth. He wanted a family that he could fellowship with. A family that only he being the father could meet the needs of this family. Human resources can't do that for you. But God can. And so he, he raised the man up and he stood there. And I'll tell you, I remember reading in a translation, just in, just in, not written down translation, but just in translations of he, Hebraic words. He said, God, and then he said, kneeled. And I thought, God, you don't kneel to anyone. And he laughed. I could hear him laugh. He said, you think I knelt? 
in subordination to someone? He said, when I created Adam, I knelt the way you do to let your children run to you. Because he loved the man. And notice when Adam sinned and he fell, When he sinned and he fell, that's not when God found out about it, when Adam answered him. He came to Adam and he said, where are you? Where are you, Adam? Adam, where are you? He said, I hid myself because I was afraid. Did you know in translation, the literal wording there, he says, where are you? Where are you? It, it really says, confess to me. He knew where he was and he came to him and he said I was afraid the first time word the word of fear had ever been uttered and all the fear you know of in the whole realm of existence is Adam's faith running in reverse that's where all the fear you know of came from the fear of death But it was almost like he was saying to you and I, we can see it easy now. See the hole you came out of? And the scripture talks about a hole that you come from. David said, I was carefully wrought in an underground workshop of God. All of it was there. It was like, see the hole? I promised a resurrection. That's what that was, remember? And he looked at the serpent and said, the seed of the woman's coming. There is no seed of a woman. There's a seed of a man. He's prophesying the virgin birth. And he'll come and he'll crush your head and you'll bruise his heel. Speaking of the crucifixion. We looked at all these great sights. And they move you to no ends. And they should. But when you see Golgotha, you think, yay, yay, Golgotha, the place of the skull. Well, it was taught by ancients, more ancient than we, that one reason it was the place of the skull is that's where Adam's skull was buried. So where the first Adam's skull lay, the last Adam came and died. These things are parallel on purpose. God's timing is perfect. And I will say this and then I will stop. Three times now. I don't even know what time I have and I'm not asking, so don't tell me. <laughs> I can preach as I'm exiting the yard. <laughs> the Lord spoke to Abraham. Abram then. And he said, take now your son. Now I want you to let your prophetic ears go straight up through this tent roof. Take now your son, your only son whom you love this should be something you should it should just leap inside you your only son whom you love bring him out here to one of the mountains I will show thee of and Abram and when he said he came by and he told him he said Abram here am I he said said he came by and did tempt Abram that's the word really attempt he said now we're going on an adventure to it to attempt this thing he was in covenant with Abram he was in covenant with him in Genesis 15 he made a covenant for this land and so he comes by and he says take now your son your only son Isaac whom you love and bring him out here until unto um, one of the mountains I will show thee of in the land of Moriah Moriah is a region of mountains as you know so he saddled his ass and he took two young men with him. History declares it was Ishmael and Eleazar. And he took them with him. And he comes out through the land. And he began, he suddenly lift up his eyes after three days. He lift up his eyes after three days and saw the place afar off. And I... I I'm no Hebrew scholar, but I can study. And it's the word I think they say, uh, hamakom, means in the future out here. 
At that moment, he stepped into the future and left the two young men behind. He said, you stay here and I and the lad will go yonder and I and the lad will come back. And so he stepped into the future with Isaac, his only son. And he heads into the future toward that mountain he saw. One of the highest mountains there is Calvary. Oh, brother, no, this, no, no. And he heads out toward it. And Isaac asks a question. Here is, the, here is the wood. Here is the knife. But where is the lamb for the offering? And Abram said to him, Abraham said to him, God will provide himself a lamb. Remember that. And it said they both went together. That means he stopped and explained to him what he was going to do on that mountain. Because Isaac had to be a willing sacrifice. And he wasn't a child either. He was somewhere between 33 and 35. <laughs> and so he takes him up the mountain. And they build the altar. <laughs> Have you guessed yet where this is going? Yep. <laughs> this was the covenant of Genesis 15, and it was a secret and a mystery hidden in Abram's heart between him and God. That's why he didn't hesitate when the Lord said, Come, we'll attempt this thing now. We're going to seal the covenant. You give me your son, and I'm bound by covenant to give you mine. And so he gets up and he follows out there. He has to explain to Isaac, Abraham, a type of the father, Isaac, a type of the son. They get out there. And the reason Abram took two young men with him is because he saw in the future. He saw in the future in Genesis 15, he saw two thieves go with Jesus to the cross. So he took two young men with him. Both of them wanted the covenant, but only one was promised it. Eleazar wanted it, Ishmael wanted it, but only Isaac was promised it. And so they start toward the highest peak in the Moriah. And he steps into the future. And he lays the wood on Isaac's back. Why? Because he saw Jesus carry the cross. And he starts up the mountain just like he saw it. He gets to the top of the mountain and he, he builds the altar and Isaac, a willing sacrifice, laid down on the altar. And he draws the knife. And he reaches the knife back. And when he comes down to slay his son, the angel of the Lord said, Abraham, Abraham, here am I. Do the, do the lad no harm. For now I know. Not God, God knew. Now the angel knows. The seed has been planted. <laughs> now watch close. He lift up his eyes and there's a ram caught in a tree. <laughs> By his own horns or his own power. So in the future, a ram caught in a tree by his own power became the substitute for the man. He became the substitute for the man. It wasn't what Abraham had to believe is what Christians never seem to get. It was covenant and tribal covenant knowledge has been lost. He had to believe a substitute would show up before the knife came. He wasn't believing anything else. He knew a substitute was promised in the chapter 15. And he had to believe the substitute would show up. Would he do it? Would Isaac do it? Yes, they did it. And when the knife came down, the substitute bleeded out of the... Uh, <laughs> they took the round, offered it instead of his son. And Abraham said this. He called the place, the place, Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh Jireh. He called the place that because watch now he said in this place, 
it shall be seen. Well, now we're back to the it. What is the it? Isaac asked him about it down at the foot of the mountain. Here is the fire, or here's the wood, here's the knife. Where is the lamb? God will provide himself a lamb. That was a ram in the bush. And he said, in this mountain, it, that lamb, that God will provide, will be seen. And it was there he was crucified. And it was there the Megan David was completed. It was there that you were grafted in. And now you live in the middle. I have a bus. That's, that's bus. one. Sorry. This one. Oh, we are we are bossless. Oops, sorry. One, three, and five is here. We don't have a bus. It's okay. Hello to the camera. 
Hello. Hi. Oh, hi. Smile. Smile for the camera. <laughs> It's about to start. Turn down. Okay, come and give me a hand. What do you need? Number 38. What? Number 38. Number 37. Right, who's missing? Seven. Okay. Who's missing? Alright, let's go to the museum. <laughs> Aloha! <laughs> awesome. Uh, we are standing today here in, uh, okay, look at my green light. See here, this is Jaffa Gate of today. See Jaffa Gate of today? Here. See there is three towers, three towers, three towers, they built by Herod. And he gave them names, this is Fatsahel, like his brother. This is Hippikos, his friend. This is his wife, Miriam. I mean, why he built here three towers? To protect the city from this side. Because, as you remember, if you go to Jaffa Gate and go down to the market, it's down here. So it's easy to attack the city from here. And this is his wife, Miriam. He loved her so much. She built so much. <laughs> and uh, uh, so this is Jaffa Gate. So, in the time of Jesus, there was only this wall, this wall, and that's it. All this area was empty. This is built after that, after Jesus, this wall. This wall built in 66 AD when the Jews prepared themselves for the war against the Romans. Why I'm telling you this, I want you to look at the green. You see this, you see where the green light? Yeah. Where is the garden tomb? Look, you see this road, you see the light? Yes. See the light, the garden tomb is here. See it? Okay. Today, the wall, the wall is going like this. It's going like this. Okay? I'll say it again. Here today, the church 